space is Carleton's rocket engineering team. We have competed three times previously at the Spaceport America Cup, once in 2017 with CU Later, once in 2018 with Orbital Redenbacher, and once in 2019 with Chef Boy Apogee. Our rocket this year is called I Can't Believe It's Not Supersonic. So the, so the main design goals for this rocket are to incorporate our student research and develop body tubes and our student research and develop nose cone, both of which will be made of fiberglass. The interesting thing about the nose cone is it will also include a pitot-static tube. This will allow us to directly measure our speed on ascent. So in order to support this, our, our avionics team has been working uh, all year to incorporating a second, uh, a second electronics bay into the nose cone of the rocket. Our payload team this year is also working on a novel design. So the payload will be testing out a stability assist system on descent, which will allow it to actively control its role. So the concept of operations for this year's rocket in was include the pre-flight phase, where all of our launch preparations will occur, the, ign the ignition sequence, where, all of, where, where the rocket is ready for flight and we do all of our arming and that ends at the ignition signal. So that would lead into our powered flight, where the motor is ignited and we are being carried up to Apogee by our motor. After the motor burns out, we enter unpowered flight, Unpowered flight is just when we're coasting all the way up to our apogee. Um, so then once we have reached our apogee, our electronics will um, activate our recovery system. This will deploy our drogue parachute and our payload, and then we'll stabilize the rocket on descent. So this will um, continue until we reach 1500 feet above the ground, at which um, the recovery system will cut the drogue and the payload and pull the main parachute out of its bag. But this will slow the rocket down to a safe speed, and the drogue and payload will be separate to was to uh, facilitate the testing of the payload and they will also be at a safe speed. Was once they both independently touch down, um, our post flight begins where we can begin our recovery. It was our recovery sequence of the rocket. Hello, my name is R.S. Thomas and I've been the senior aerostructures lead this year. I've been in charge of the architecture and managing the design analysis of our aerodynamic and structural components for the rocket this year. Hi, my name is Raf. I am the junior aerostructures lead and this year I have been focused on the nose cone design and analysis. The rocket comprises of four sections connected with aluminum couplers and steel fasteners. We fire our ejection system to shear off the nylon pins connecting the nose cone to the forward body tube and deploy the payload and parachutes at Apogee, which according to our simulations in Open Rocket is going to be approximately 9700 feet. We expect to reach a top airspeed of about Mach 0.7 and a max axial acceleration of approximately 6.3 Gs. We've designed the airframe to withstand about 10 Gs in axial loading and then 7 Gs in lateral loading. The nose section will have the first prototype of our SRAD fiberglass epoxy composite nose cone bonded to its coupler, which we'll also be attempting for our body tubes. In the past, we've flown with COTS nose cones and fiberglass laminated craft body tubes. A pitot-static tube will be mounted to the nose cone tip to act as an additional source of airspeed data. This data is recorded with an avionics module connected to the main avionics via a separable CAN bus connection, and its housing also mounts the nose cone eye bolt. The forward and center sections will employ our first attempts at SRAD body tubes connected to our airframe via the couplers. In the forward section, our parachutes and payload are contained. The center to forward joint has the recovery bulkhead, which mounts the main parachute eye bolt and the CO2 Raptor ejection systems. In this center section, a pair of rails and a retention plate allow for simple and secure installation of our main avionics package. This comprises of an aluminum enclosure and threaded rods for mounting our main board stack, and a 3D printed battery sandwich and an array of batteries. A CAN bus connection runs forward to the nose avionics and aftward to our camera and airframe data logging package. Cables also route aftward to the four boat tail panel mounted antennas. The aft section contains our propulsion system and aerodynamic fins mounted in our aft frame structure. This machined aluminum frame is an improved version of the design proven effective in 2018 and 2019. It comprises of a forward coupler to which thrust is transmitted via the step in the aft motor closure to the thrust ring and then through the four pairs of stringers. 
Extensive modeling and finite element analysis has been conducted to characterize the static and the buckling mechanics of this structure to demonstrate large margins of safety and since physical testing was not possible this year. Between each pair of stringers, our sandwich panel fins are mounted, which are constructed of a Nomex honeycomb core and a carbon fiber epoxy composite skin, which offers an incredibly high strength to weight ratio compared to a monolithic composite or metallic design. Similar sandwich panel fins have been flight proven in 2018 and 2019, but with a balsa core. The fins were sized iteratively in open rocket to achieve a static margin of at least 1.6 at all times during the flight. The aft frame is shrouded from the airflow with four plastic boat tail panels, which we expect to reduce the drag by on the order of 20%, something that we simulated and flew in 2019 successfully. In spite of the difficulties due to COVID-19 and the associated restrictions, we were able to adapt our previous work and employ simulation to increase our confidence in the performance of this year's airframe design. Hello, my name is Philip Hegerman and I am the propulsion lead for CU in Space this academic term. The propulsion team is responsible for the selection and development of the propulsion systems on the student rocket. We work closely with aerostructures to ensure that uh, it goes as high as it's supposed to and the rocket actually stays in one piece on the way up. This year, the team has decided that we would be entering the 10,000 foot commercial off the shelf solid motor category. Um, in addition to that, CU in Space hopes to fly its own student-developed hybrid rocket engine in the near future. So for the motor selection for this year, there was a few main considerations, one of which was that our motor had to fit it within a four grain engine casing. This is just based on structural requirements, as well as some other structural considerations, such as remaining in the low to mid transonic regime. We didn't want to go supersonic. So we ended up looking at five different motors here, all of which were simulated in open rocket. Uh, we looked at four M classes and one N class. The N class, which has the highest impulse, got us uh, the closest to the apogee we wanted. Um, the M3400 also had uh, some performance, but its thrust is so high that some of the loads during flight would be quite undesirable. So we got about 10,000 newton seconds of impulse uh, and around 2,200 newtons of thrust. Uh, it burns for about six seconds and uh, gets us up to an apogee of 9,748 feet. My name is August Lear, and I'm a member of the manufacturing subteam. This year, due to COVID, we were unable to access our on-campus manufacturing facilities that we've used in previous years, including the fiberglass and carbon composites layup lab, as well as the metal manufacturing lab. We were, however, able to produce one test carbon fiber winglet. This winglet consists of a Nomex honeycomb core wrapped in carbon fiber and laid up using the wet layup process. The wet layup process has been used in previous years to produce our winglets, body tubes, and nose cone. This year, we would like to test the vacuum assisted resin infusion layup process. This will be especially helpful for our body tubes. As in previous years, the body tubes were produced by wrapping a cardboard tube with fiberglass and using the wet layup process. CU in Space has developed a avionics system for our rocket this year. Our student researched and designed Avionix hardware and software is capable of deploying our drogue parachute at Apogee, tracking our rocket's location, and collecting a variety of sensor data. Our Avionix hardware is built using a modular stacking design to support an iterative development process. At the heart of our Avionix system is an ARM microcontroller running custom firmware built by us from the ground up. Attached to the microcontroller is a small suite of sensors including a high-precision barometer for altitude measurement, an inertial measurement unit, a high-speed accelerometer, and a GNSS receiver. Our avionics software collects data from these sensors to drive the parachute deployment state machine and records the sensor data to an SD card. Live telemetry is broadcast using a LoRa radio to our custom ground station software. 
Our avionics firmware is designed with advanced features for maintaining a reliable link, including dynamic selection between four separate antennas on the rocket. Of course, we also have proven commercial off-the-shelf backups for all of the key functionality of our custom avionics system. Our rocket carries a Perfect Flight Stratologer CF for apogee logging and redundant parachute deployment, and a Featherweight GPS tracker. Good afternoon, my name is Simon Peacock and I am the exec for Carleton University's CU and Space Recovery Team. This year we will have two parachutes during our descent. We'll have a 12-foot main chute and a 4-foot drogue chute that will both be made out of ripstop nylon. At Apogee, the Raptor CO2 ejection system will activate. This consists of a redundant and a main CO2 um, canister, which will be triggered and activated by the avionics bay at Apogee. It will um, release release pressure into the nose cone, sharing two bolts, letting the nose cone pop off, and thus the drogue chute can pop out, pulling out the payload. Then underneath that, it will be the main bag. And parallel to the main bag's line will be the line with our detachment mechanisms. Our deployment systems will consist of two methods, a uh, main deployment method and a redundant deployment method. Our main deployment method will be a SRAD altimeter, which will be in series with this three ring assembly. It will function with a solenoid. The altimeter will, will activate at 1500 feet above ground level. It will then trigger the solenoid to retract and thus unfolding the three ring assembly. When under tension, this will happen very quickly. Our secondary release will be an RRC3 sport altimeter run in series with this tender to sender, it's a fully COTS system. And at, at 1400 feet, so 100 feet later, it will trigger the black powder and detach this tender to sender. I'm Aaron, I'm the senior payload lead for CU in Space. This year, the payload team has continued to develop its iterative 3U CubeSat standard payload, consisting of an internal avionics bay and recovery hardware. Most of the development this year went towards the CubeSat's frame and towards the CubeSat's internal payload. The frame this year was redesigned to ensure the CubeSat could be easily manufactured without access to a full machine shop. The CubeSat is split into three sections. The recovery bay contains the eye bolt for attaching to the recovery line, uh, the GPS patch antenna, and a scale model Tesla Roadster. The avionics bay contains all of the power electronics and battery, as well as a Raspberry Pi 4B, which runs the flight software, and collects data from sensors. During descent, the Raspberry Pi will run a navigation software that will compare its current location and altitude to the original location of the launch site. It will then provide a direction towards this target. The main focus of development was on the payload bay, which contains a reaction wheel attitude control system. A microcontroller receives instructions from the Raspberry Pi as a direction to point in, and receives sensor data from a magnometer to determine its current location, and a gyroscope to return, determine the CubeSat's current angular speed. It then implements a feedback algorithm to control the speed of a spinning reaction wheel, which will apply a torque. The speed of the SRAD reaction wheel is regulated with a commercial off-the-shelf brushless DC motor and motor controller to reduce the complexity of this already very complex system.